for uh, for coming back. I, I appreciate it. Um, and we'll get started with um, uh, our final speaker for this afternoon. Uh, morning, morning, it's morning. It's still morning. It's still morning. And um, this is Kari R. Smith. She's the digital archivist. Um, Insti digital archivist at the Institute Archives and Special Collections at the MIT Library and instructor in the Digital Archives Specialist Curriculum Certificate at the Society of American Archivists. And she's going to talk to us today about um, a, a, a different model to what you've heard so far this morning. So. Hi and good morning. Um, so I'm going to address the the bit that that um, some people had asked about earlier, which is the sort of how do you learn when you're on the job and you're not two years out of school and you need that training. So that's the um, portion that I'm going to be um, talking about today. So it's again this idea of learning while on the job and digital curation tr training for practitioners. So those of us are already in the field doing the work. How do we sort of keep keep our um, skills up to date? How do we learn additional skills when we need them? And how do we sort of push that out to other people? People. So since the overall theme of the Lyricist uh, uh, Town Hall here is, is that sort of hands-on training, I wanted to first just sort of step back a bit and talk about what is hands-on, um, especially because uh, the way that I often hear people speak about hands-on is this sort of very like, I need to hold a tool in my hand and do a thing on a computer, which is one form of hands-on. So that's, we've got the guy up there with the tool. Um, these, this clip art that I'm going to show you is um, fantastic. It's provided freely available. It's all clip art about digital preservation. It's provided by the uh, Royal Library in Denmark. Um, so I have a citation for that at the end, but it's, it's really, really uh, great clip art. So we've got sort of hands-on of like there's a particular tool. It's a computer program, and I need to know how to use it. Or it's a hardware device, and I need to figure out how do I hook it up. So that's one way of thinking about what's hands-on. Um, but when uh, we teach the Digital Preservation Management Workshop, uh, Nancy McGovern and myself and a couple other instructors, one of the things that we really talk about is hands-on for management, hands-on for thinking about what is digital curation in general. So things like developing workflows. So this is an example of one of the workflows. Um, just trying to diagram out, showing people the workflows, the tools that are being used, where are they being used um, in the thing. Understanding how to build that type of stuff is also certainly hands-on work. Um, also, the idea of the you know the guy trying to get a handle over his digital his digital objects there, um, just the idea of thinking through what are the policies that we need to, to have in place. How do we write those policies? How do we critique other people's policies? How do we, like um, Andrea was mentioning, how do we read a specification, a technical specification for a standard to understand what do we therefore need to do if we've got content in that type of format? So these are all to me very much hands-on activities. And when we think about hands-on in that way, we can kind of step back a bit from the idea that you've got to be at a place with a computer, with a hardware device that you've got to work on. And I think it really helps us to frame out the idea of hands-on training in a way that allows for some possibly different models than what the residency is doing, um, which is a really great, very, very practical, tangible hands-on not only with the idea of material itself, but also the idea of talking with people and having that sort of hands-on, hands-reach um, type of uh, interaction that we can have for the type of training that we need. So um, the other hands-on there is, is a photo of me doing, um, it's, it's a snapshot out of a video from a presentation I gave that was on, um, <clears throat> excuse me, on document security and looking at the differences between analog document security and digital document security and the implications of document security for access into the future, therefore also preservation curation activities that we need to do. Um, so all of that in that sense of hands-on um, is, is the kinds of learning, training, doing that we can do while we're on the job. So what are some of those options? So things like mentoring circles. This is something that the New England Archivist uh, Society, uh, NEA, New England Archivist Society. I don't know if we're a society or an association. Sorry about that. Anyway, the New England Archivists group. Um, but this is one of the things that um, in this last year they put into place. And I was a mentor um, on this circle. And the circle that we that we worked with, that I worked with, was a virtual circle of, um, of early professionals. So these were people on the job um, who were recently sort of minted as archivists, but were sort of looking for more opportunities, more advice, really. So it was the idea of a mentoring circle in the sense of, now what do I do? How do I approach a problem? Where can I go to get answers and find solutions? 
Um, it was a really interesting model, I thought. We did it, it was, uh, people had to commit for 10 months. Um, there were two of us. We met once a month for um, an hour and a half uh, online. We did video, um, video meetups. And it was, I think, a really, uh, for me, it was the first time I had done that as a mentor. And I thought it was really valuable in the sense that not only did it build this cohort among the people who were the virtual, men, the, the mentees who were out dispersed around the New England area, so they weren't all in Massachusetts, which was the whole reason for this virtual circle, um, but it helped them to build a cohort sort of across the states, find out who else is sort of having the same kinds of issues they are, be able to reach out, and also um, during the 10 months, people sort of moved around in jobs as well. So it was interesting for them to kind of talk with each other around, you know, well, what did you do to get this new job? What kinds of things were the, were, the, were the people interviewing you for? So even just those hands-on tangibles of what are the skills people are looking for? What are the kinds of things that people are hiring for was a really great idea. Um, and Gabby Redwine, who is now at Yale, um, she and I were talking uh, two weeks ago now um, about this idea of mentoring circles as well for the, so we're looking at uh, wanting to build up a mentoring circle for digital archivists in the New England area. And in this case, it could be both sort of the idea of the virtual mentoring, um, but in a very topical way. So rather than the idea of I'm an early professional and I'm just trying to kind of understand how, you know, I'm, I'm having these frustrations, this doesn't seem to be going well at work, how do I sort of navigate that as a professional? In this case, it would be very specifically, we're all trying to kind of do the same task, what do we do? Um, another thing with the NEA um, that I launched was a uh, NEA roundtable for digital archives. And in that, I asked the question, are you a practitioner? Are you interested <laughs> or are you a vendor of services for those ideas? Because I thought that those three different groups could in and of themselves provide interesting learning opportunities and different perspectives, but also it sort of give the idea of if you're just interested in something or how to do a tool, that's great, but it's a different kind of learning that you might want to do than if you're actually faced with a problem at your desk right now, I need to do this thing, how can I get help on that? So trying to sort of match up people with the I've got skills, you've got skills, um, I've tried this thing out, not working for me, who can I pick up the phone and call? Or how can we sort of get together a video hangout where we can all talk through these problems and issues? So that's one way um, that I think as a model going forward would be a really great idea. And that would be something that could be taken up by local or regional societies or associations. Um, because again, it doesn't, that costs nothing to do. Effectively, it was our time um, that we put into it. So there is that cost. We'll talk a little bit about some of those challenges in a little bit. The other idea um, is the idea of uh, reading groups, reading circles. Um, so there's a lot of great uh, literature out there on doing digital curation and doing digital preservation management on how to do these types of things as well. So another um, uh, model that's been around for a long time is this idea of sort of reading groups. So we all have sort of the, the town, local, city, book club, book, you know, we're gonna read this book this year, everyone in the town's gonna do it and we're all gonna have conversations and talk about it. So we have sort of a base level of understanding, of discussion, of commonality that we can go through. So doing the idea of a reading group as, as a local initiative, whether that's at your organization, or if you're the only person at your organization doing something, maybe it's in your town or across your region, but picking a type of resource that you can work through. And this was a success at, um, Christy Peterson uh, did this with one of the places that she had worked at. She had them all work through the digital management uh, uh, digital preservation management tutorial, which I'll show you also as an online resource, which has been the base of a lot of other um, digital preservation training material that's gone out into the world. Um, so this idea of reading groups where again, you know, it's sort of, okay, we've read this thing, what do we know about it? Bringing in maybe some other people with, as advice, um, but, but trying to gain that commonality and really raise everybody up at the same time, which is one of the things that as we're building capacity in our community, we really wanna try and address. So that's another option. Reciprocal visits is another thing that I've been involved with lately, um, and it's a great idea. It's the kind of thing you can do generally that um, the resource allocation isn't as high, or if it is, um, you can kind of make it one-sided uh, so that it's your own resources that you're only ever putting out, um, which is something that you can control a lot better. So uh, I recently had a, um, a fellow, a woman who had gotten a fellowship from the National Library of Australia uh, as a traveling fellowship. And she came to, to work with me for two weeks at MIT to basically shadow me on being a digital archivist. 
Um, so that was a really interesting, uh, uh, interesting opportunity for me as well as for her. Um, during that time, I was able to sort of get her in to talk to other people, um, both across the Boston area um, at, at other organizations. Harvard um, uh, brought her over and, and did a really great three-hour presentation on what they were doing with digital archives, which I went to. Um, so I learned a lot as well, uh, currently, about what our partners down the, our, our friends, partners, uh, down the road were doing um, at the Harvard University Archives. And she went to a couple other archives as well while she was in town. Um, so I learned a bit about, well, what were they sort of doing at the National Library of Australia? What was different? What were their approaches? They were using some of the same software tools that we're using for, um, for managing our collections, but in a very different way. So that was interesting as well, to kind of get that type of a thing. Um, another set of reciprocal visits um, that uh, Nancy McGovern, who's also at MIT Libraries, and myself have been doing is just in the Boston area. So Tufts um, University has a, a great archives um, and good program, and they've been doing a lot with digital records for a long time. So we've done the, we go over there for an afternoon, and then maybe a month later, they come over to our place in the afternoon. And so we sort of talk about what are our policies, our workflows, how are we dealing with tools of varying sorts. And that kind of reciprocal visits have been really good, um, and not only sort of makes us have to teach, um, which is the, the, the other um, option out there that's a really, really great one for, for building your own capacity, um, but to sort of really share out what are we doing, getting that outside check on, does this make sense? You know, is there something I, I missed because someone else is doing another type of the task or they've got a different solution for a problem? So the reciprocal visits is a nice way as well, um, as I was saying about sort of funding models, because we bring someone in, so maybe we give them lunch, we sort of tour them around, but you're not necessarily paying, and, and you can have 20, 35 people, however many, from your own place, you know, go to some kind of an open talk. So you actually get the benefit of a lot of your staff understanding something from another group is doing. And then you, one person, or, or whoever in your department, goes to their organization. Again, maybe they, you know, they give you lunch or something, but, it, but that's all the cost is. So you're not funding to have a whole person come in. You're not paying them necessarily. Often there's, there's no money involved. It's, it's very, very, very low budget. Um, it's the, you know, I get myself to wherever that place is. They get themselves to wherever I am. Um, so Gabby Redwine, who's down at Yale, um, the digital archivist there, just came up to MIT to the Boston area for two days, um, got funding to stay overnight, I guess, or had a friend to stay overnight with. And, um, and went to a couple different organizations to find out what are we all doing with digital archives um, and then be able to take that information back. Meanwhile, we were making her very definitely share with us what she's been up to and what she's been working on um, so, we could, so we could learn from that hands-on in person. Um, so again, you know, looking at here's what we're doing, take a look at this thing, take it home, um, find out about that. Um, and the other way, which both uh, George and Andrea have already spoken to, is, is teaching. Teach yourself. Um, teach others is, I guess, what I mean by that. Be a teacher yourself. Um, the best way to learn something is to have to teach it to someone else. I think, hands down, that's the, that's the absolute best way to, to learn how to do something. Um, so if you were to say, I'm going to put on a little class for, you know, for my colleagues, I'm going to do a little webinar, even if it goes nowhere, um, just to sort of, you know, how would you document out something? How would you teach someone else a new tool? How would you do that kind of a thing? Because in, in having to pull together that information, you really have to learn something yourself. Someone asks you a question, it's like, oh, I don't know, I, I didn't do that. I, I never needed to, use, to do that when I used the tool myself, but that's a great, you know, I don't know, let's try that, let's figure that on out. Um, and so the idea of teaching um, is another really, really great hands-on way to get the experience um, that you might need for um, thinking about digital stewardship and curation. Some of the, um, just a few here of some of the resources that, that I think are, are really great out there. Um, George was talking about the idea of having this sort of national um, curriculum for this idea of digital stewardship uh, education training, digital curation, digital preservation. Um, in Europe, the DIG curve, um, which is the, um, let me read this here, Digital Curator Vocational Education Europe program. Um, and so what they're looking at is we are in a profession Right? I mean, that we're, we're professionals. Like, like other things, professions need, you need mentorship, mentorship. You need that on-hands training. You need these types of things. It is not just the academic education that we get otherwise. 
Um, so in Europe, they're putting together this vocational education training program for curators, and it has a curriculum, and it has this idea of these are the skills you need to try and learn, this, these are ways that you might learn them, and they're putting this together both as a training package, so the idea of like go to courses and learn these things, but very much in a vocational training way. And it's something I believe in the United States that we really miss out on. We've, we've kind of, unfortunately, sort of dropped vocational training off to the side for a lot of our professions. And it's either, it's either like academic training or it's not. And I think in our profession, especially given it is a profession, um, that this is something we really need to get back to. So the ditch curve um, is a nice model to look at in, in Europe. They also have this great board game, um, which, is fun, which is why I put it up here. It's called Curate. Um, the, the, the digital curation game. Um, and it's really fun. And so you can download the board and it's got cards. It's like a card game. And you say, you know, it's kind of like Monopoly, like go to jail, like your content is on obsolete media. Figure it out before you can move on. Um, you, know, so, you know, whoopsie, bit rot, what do you do now? You know, do you have six copies? Um, so it's a really, really great game. And this idea is to sort of do it with yourself, but also like play it with colleagues, play it with friends. And it sort, of, it sort of puts you three scenarios of digital curation to try and think about some of the decision-making skills, which is another very important hands-on skill we need. But it's hard to get the hands-on skill of decision-making unless either you're in it or you can participate generally in, with activities outside of your own organization, because you may just not have those decision points come up at your own place. So a game like this is kind of fun because they, they've already built into it a lot of these sorts of scenarios that you might need to think through. How would I solve that problem? What would I do with this? So the, so the curate game is, is a fun one out there. Um, the other thing to make sure to not uh, overlook is YouTube. There's a lot of great uh, hands-on training <laughs> material on YouTube, and it's certainly one of the go-to places where I go if I get a new tool or I get a new physical component and I need to figure out how do I hook this thing up to my computer, how do I use this tool, how do I install this software, what can I do with it, YouTube videos um, are really fantastic. This is that idea of, you know, doing a little video for training that then you put out to other people. Because what we're trying to do, right, is to build our capacity, not just my capacity, but really build the capacity of our community. So if you've got a tool and you can say, I know how to install this thing, do a little video of yourself making it happen, and then put that out. You know, help people learn from what you've learned. Um, so, the, so YouTube's got great videos. They've got... Um, uh, sort of more informational type of uh, videos out there. There's also, like I said, a lot of the sort of hands-on, here's how to install the tool, 10 minutes long. Here's how to configure the tool, 10 minutes long. <laughs> you know, they're generally pretty short videos, um, but it's a great way to start out with the, I just bought this thing and I really have no idea what to do with it. Search for that thing on YouTube and you're likely to get it. So YouTube's a great, a great thing to, um, to use as supplementary material for trying to think about how to learn hands-on. The digital preservation management tutorial up there in the corner um, with the, uh, the, the uh, time glass in the computer um, is, um, is the uh, tutorial that's been online since, uh, it's been updated, but it's been online since 2003. Um, and that was developed by Ann Kinney and Nancy McGovern when they started the digital preservation management workshop series out of Cornell. Um, that workshop series is still going on. Um, it's now run out of MIT, where Nancy is. I'm an instructor on that as well. And we just taught, uh, did the five-day workshop last week, actually. Um, uh, 46th workshop, I think, um, over the years. So it's a great uh, tutorial. This is the kind of thing where you, you can't do this in one sitting. It's, it's multiple days. It's, multi it's weeks long if you really walk through it. But this is a great opportunity to do a kind of um, let's get together a reading group and let's walk ourselves through this tutorial and the various parts of it. There's a lot of hands-on activities in the sense of write a management, write a, write a policy, figure out your workflows. So it's that hands-on. It's not a hands-on computer tool that I'm doing, but it's hands-on in the sense of what do you need to steward your information? What kinds of curation activities do we need to be doing? And it helps you with model documents that you can look at as examples and then build out your own. Um, and it also has some fun things like uh, the timeline of obsolescence. And so just sort of fun facts about thinking about digital curation stewardship you know, from the last 60 years that this has been going on uh, more broadly um, in, the, in, in our larger community of digital asset management. So it gives them a lot of good history, really talks to the various standards, lots of resources out there of sort of where to point you to go next to find out more information. Um, and there are other 
uh, certainly other tutorials and toolkits out there. Um, in Canada, CHIN, which is the Canadian Heritage Information Network, um, has recently put out um, a digital preservation toolkit, which is based on the digital preservation management tutorial. Um, and so that's another, uh, another one that's very focused on museums. So if you're in a museum um, type environment, the CHIN toolkit um, is specifically geared towards uh, looking at museum information. Um, and the other set of readings that personally I, I, I use a lot um, because they're really great are the Digital Preservation Coalition, um, which is based out of the UK, DPC, online.org. Um, they uh, produce, uh, they, they contract out for authors to produce what they call technology watch reports. And this is an example of three of them here um, from the, over the last year and a half. They give sort of a state of the art, like a state of where, where are we with intellectual property rights for digital preservation, or where are we with digital forensics and preservation. So it goes through sort of what, what is the point of the topic? Why do we need to think about intellectual property rights for digital preservation? And then it sort of goes through what are some of the laws, what are various resources that are out there, who's been working on things sort of like in an organization, um, which organizations have been working specifically on things. If there's particular hardware or software tools, they also refer to those. Um, so it gives basically a summary of what's kind of been going on in these areas over the last few years and kind of current initiatives to keep your eye on. And they're great, watch, they're great documents in that it, it, it's a nice summary written by um, an expert um, who sort of has gone out already and sort of pulled what's going on out there and then pulled that all together for you. So generally they're between 40 and 60, 70 pages, probably, um, depending on what they are. They're free. They're, you can download them. You can print them in color um, if you want, bind them yourself, or just use the PDF online. But they've been doing them for um, probably at least seven, eight years. And so there's a lot, there's a huge variety of them. The preservation metadata one has just come into second edition, which is very exciting if you're looking at how do I even think about understanding preservation metadata? What is that? This very short. Um, guide by Brian Lavoie um, is, a, is a really great kind of primer on where are people doing things, where should I look, what's going on. Um, so as readings also, that's another area um, that I definitely um, would recommend that people take a look at. Okay. I'm going to go back a little bit here. When I'm Thinking again about um, when we're talking about the hands-on activities and experiences for, for professional training, I just want to back up and talk a little bit about um, some of the foundations upon which the, the DEPO project, um, the Digital Preservation Outreach and Education, and the Digital Preservation Management um, Program are built on. And that's these ideas that um, you can sort of conceive of that there are, there are three legs to a stool that we're trying to, to maintain in a balanced way, and that there are sort of five stages or so um, that you sort of go through as you're thinking about your learning, your capacity, and what your program's doing. And so in thinking about what is hands-on, um, we can try and address each of these things. So the three sort of stable things that you want to have in place in a, in a preservation program or in your curatorial program to steward your objects are a financial resources, so human resources, financial resources um, type, of, um, type of leg. Your um, organization, what do we, what, does the organization have policies in place? Do we have, um, do we know what we're collecting? You know, how do we know um, that we actually need to steward things for more than five or 10 years, which puts us in the boat of needing to steward these things if they're digital? Um, and then the other one is the technology side. So in thinking about what do we need to learn, it's really important to know that there are these three areas, in fact, that as an organization anyway, we need to have the capacity within and not just the technology. I need some hands-on software tools or something to deal with my technology. But the whole reason you're using that technology is because I have some policy that I have to do something and I have some resources, um, human resources or otherwise, that I have to put to that. So being able to sort of understand how those three things work together is another um, big component where talking with other organizations, finding out what other people have been up to um, can be very, very helpful. Using this idea of five stages from uh, we just found out this is going to be a problem for us, like we just took in an, an acquisition of, of movie and we didn't have any before and now we realize 
we don't know what to do with film, right? Digital film. Um, two, we've already had a large collection of digitized photographs for a long time, and we're very clear on what we need to do with digitized photographs, digital, you know, so digital images. When you're up at a stage five, so you, so you know what to do with all your photographs, and you think, right, so we're pretty good with, with what we need to learn for digital curation, for all these things. When the film comes in, you sort of start back at zero, right? You're like, well, now I don't know what to do with film. So there may be some lessons learned that you can cross over, but you still have to know, in this case, it would be, what is the technology implications for dealing with film? What's the storage implications for dealing with film? That kind of crosses over into the finance side of things. Um, do we decide to um, have multiple copies or fewer copies of film? Um, that's kind of that policy side of things. So you really have to kind of go back and readdress everything, which is why, this, why thinking about um, what do you have at your own institution, what organizations do you know about, or could you put a question out to and say, we've never dealt with this before, who has? Let's have an exchange. I know a lot about something something, and you guys are clearly working on um, video, let's have that exchange, let's have that partnership. So when you're thinking about, you know, we're pretty good in one area, that's great. How can you help others who, who aren't there yet? And then how also, when you get to the point where you need that help, how do you sort of do that in trade, trade in kind, where you're not having to necessarily go to an expensive training program or able to bring in a consultant? We are our own consultants in this field, in most part. So how can we leverage the knowledge that we already have uh, to be used with each other. So some of the challenges that we need to meet, is, is, as I can see them, um, are this whole very important but difficult challenge of carving out the time for learning. And this is something that I think all of us face. We've got a lot of work to do. You know, we need to do this work. And we also now need to learn something else. We need to build our capacity. So how do we do that? And I think it really is. Um, it's an explicit activity. And if we can say, right, so we need one hour a week to be able to you know, read, some of these, um, read some of these things out there, one hour a week to participate in a webinar with colleagues. You know, that's, if you can do one of those things a week for one hour, that's four hours of time. But in doing so, ideally, you'll learn enough that you'll then be saving a lot more time as you move on in the future because you'll be more efficient, more effective, and you'll be able to sort of really move things forward in your organization. It's a big challenge, but I'm, I'm a firm um, believer whenever I look at jobs or look at job postings, one of the things that, and I know in the residencies, this is a big part of that too, is that some percentage of the time on your job has to be explicit to training. It's not a one time I can go to a workshop if there's funding and it's available. But actually saying like, look, even I need 30 minutes a week <laughs> to do something. You can learn a lot in 30 minutes. Like I said, there's all those little YouTube videos that are like five, 10 minutes long. So if you can just say, I have to carve out that time, and it may be not the same time every week, schedules float, but just knowing that I do take that time and that has to be useful because it is part of my job. And that as professionals, we have to continually be up to date in order to do our work. And just like other professionals, if you were a pipe fitter, you'd be going to trainings. If you were a farmer, you'd be going to the pesticide training. I know, because I used to have to go to those pesticide trainings. Um, but there are things that you just have to do in order to keep up in your profession. And I think you know, we're getting to that point in our profession of digital stewards and curators where that does become something that we need to make sure we're doing. In the make the case for funding bit there, um, this is where I'm going to go on just a little bit about the difference between the academic training and this idea of vocational training um, that I think is really critical for those of us who aren't just out of master's program or who are on the job and are, and are moving around. At uh, where I work and places I've worked in the past, which are at academic universities, um, if I wanted to go get another master's degree, that would be paid for, right, or some portion of it. They'll give me tuition re remuneration for being able to take classes. Now, if I need to go take a professional training course um, to do something to help me with my profession, um, they won't pay for that because it's not an academic degree. 
Now, I already have an academic degree, <laughs> a couple of academic degrees, so I don't feel like that's really where I need to go right now. I need to get this professional vocational training. And so this idea of making the case for funding isn't just for at your immediate boss level, but in, in the sense of actually advocating out for the fact that we need to be able to have funding available to do things like the Digital Archive Specialist Certificate um, through the Society of American Archivists. Um, there's a digital curation online program through University of Maine, Orono, that's recently started up. Um, and they've been able to lobby for the fact that, whoops, that everyone, um, I can't work my own phone. Does anyone have a YouTube video <laughs> to make that happen? Um, but they've made the case that anyone can come, anyone can do that program for in-state tuition because they know that there's not a lot of people in Orono, Maine because it's way up there in the north. Um, but there's a lot of people who might want that program who are not in, or in, in, uh, up, at, up in northern Maine. And so even international students, they're letting just take in-state tuition. So how do we sort of build these sort of programs and capacities, but also allow us um, and, and among ourselves to be able to have these sort of training opportunities that we need that are not necessarily the academic kind of degree that perhaps other professions might need? Um, so making the case for funding, again, at your own organization, institution, if they'll pay for the IT people to go out and get certified with, you know, Microsoft certification, why aren't they doing that also for your own, for, for you when you need to get, cert, you know, you need to be able to learn how to use certain software tools types of things. Um, skills shops like uh, Rails Girls, there's a lot of free, uh, someone else shaking their head on that, yeah, um, Rails Girls if you're a girl <laughs> and you want to learn Ruby on Rails, um, which is one of the programming uh, things out there right now, there are these free workshops that are sort of around the country um, hosted by this organization called Rails Girls, um, which is really great. Um, and, you know, making sure that we're not afraid to do things like host others and be hosted in return. Make sure we're not afraid to show your stuff out there. You know, hang out your dirty laundry. In this case, like, that's actually what's going to help us um, to learn better. I, at, our, at our digital preservation management workshop, we're doing a whole section on workflows these days. And in the last two workshops, I've done an exercise on workflows. And basically, we give someone a work, we give groups workflows, and we say, righty then, take a look at this workflow and say what's good about it and what's not so good about it. We don't say what's bad about it, what's not so good about it. And it's one of my first workflows that I developed at MIT. And people rip it apart. And it's interesting for me now, because I have to, I've like stepped back, you know, I have a better one now. Um, but it's really interesting to be like, people can learn from the fact that, oh, this didn't really make a lot of sense here. I needed, there was a, there was no key. There's no, there's no explanation about what this, there's no arrows, like there's no nothing here. Um, but I can see what you were getting at. And it's, that's a great way of letting other people help you step back from what you're used to looking at all the time and help you to build your capacity. So put your stuff out there. Don't be afraid to have someone come into your place because what you think might not be much that you're doing to other people, it might be a great thing and they hadn't thought about that before or they, hadn't, they haven't been able to work in that area. So make sure that you're, you're willing and, and able to be open like that. Share back to the community. Bring people into your, into your house as well. Um, that's the kind of thing where not all the directors want to be doing that, but I think we need to make the case that it's critical at our level and, and within um, our profession that we have to have these exchanges and interchanges. So thank you for listening. Um, I think um, Q&A time. time, if anyone's got questions for me. Oh, yeah? OK. I'll start with, uh, you mentioned several good modules for online training or tutorials. And there was mm -hmm. a question for, for the, from the field. This, I was thinking, actually, this could be a great topic for the panel to address uh, a little bit later also. But someone asked specifically about uh, XML training tools. Are there any tools that you use for XML training? Yeah, actually, um, a really good, if you're interested in sort of the technology side of thing, a really great uh, email list to get onto is Code for Lib. Um, there's actually was a very recent thread about XML learning um, and, and, and where to do it <laughs> um, on that thread. So if you go to the Code for Lib um, archives uh, re in the recent uh, set of them, there was people talking about, you know, how can I get a training course on how to do XML? Um, so I find that actually I just sort of 
I keep it on and I, I look at it like once a week or twice a week. There's a lot that comes over there. The other thing that comes over Code for Lib um, quite often are job postings. And it's really interesting to take a look at them to get a sense of what are people hiring for? What are the kinds of skills they're looking for? Um, these are often jobs that are like IT in libraries and archives, but also um, more and more coming across as digital preservation types of jobs, software developers for developing with digital archives and digital libraries. Um, so you kind of get a sense of the, the question of which, what programming languages should I learn. There's a bunch of that kind of thing in these job postings that you can read that. But I would just say right now, Code for Libs 1, and they can answer during the panel Code also. also Code Academy also. OK, another good place to take a look. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, second question, I'm just kind of inferring uh, a question here from uh, some information that was being uh, exchanged by uh, people in the chat. Uh, there was a reference to an article called Trading Libraries Off of the Roar, but Will It Soar, uh, related to uh, sharing staff and, and, and doing some exchanges like that. Uh, this was done here in, in Georgia, and uh, the, the article came from Georgia Library Quarterly. And ultimately, it didn't didn't soar <laughs> for them. And uh, this article was published in 2006. So I pointed out that perhaps there could be some issues now that, you know, social media certainly can help us to solve with that. But I'm wondering, what are the pitfalls that you all have found with staff exchanges? Yeah. And what are some of the ways that you've solved those pitfalls? Yeah, one of the things when, when I was talking about meeting the challenges, um, one, of the, one of the great challenges in hosting people is the fact that you're hosting them. And it's really hard to get your own work done um, when they're shadowing you and you're sort of telling them and training them. And, it, and, it's, and it's a perspective thing, right? There's like the work getting done, which is the work of networking, the work of understanding and learning and teaching and training versus the work of accessioning and processing the content I got on my desk right here right now. So in some ways, it's just a flip of thinking about like, what are you doing in your job and what is that job to do? Um, but it is, a, it is a, a critique that I've had for this idea, we're going to host people to come in. The woman who came for two weeks, um, it was fantastic. I learned a lot. It made me really talk through to explain to her what I was doing and why I made the decisions I made, which made me rethink a bunch of things that I had been doing um, with her input, which was really great. But I certainly didn't acquire any collections during those two weeks because I was busy with her working with her. So that's one thing about this idea of staff exchanges, that idea of onboarding um, that they were talking about in the residencies. If you actually you know, do a staff exchange, you know, like I want to do something for a week, that's a lot of time to get someone up to speed, understand the organization, get them on board. You know, who are all the other staff that are involved in meeting with those people, talking with them and all. I think personally that the, um, the benefit of doing that is really high, um, but it can be a challenge to make that case. Um, depending on what your very specific focus is and what the general um, uh, work environment and work culture is um, at your organization. Over there. Do you have any recommendations when you work um, like in a corporate archive, or I work at the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, mm -hmm. and so sometimes I feel like a leech because I can learn from other people, but I can't necessarily talk about our collections are what we have because some of it's either, you know, a corporate, it would be proprietary or we have classified information. Mm -hmm. How how do you create those reciprocal relationships when you can't necessarily, you know, share what you're working on? Yeah. So we have we have that um, with one of our uh, close colleagues um, in Boston, in the Boston area, um, someone who works at the Lincoln Labs for MIT. It's all classified work. <laughs> so nothing they can't tell us anything specifically about what they do. Um, but we can talk generally about, I'm using this tool. I'm trying this thing. That has nothing to do with your work as proprietary, whatever. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're using Bagger to do blah, blah, blah. It's not working. I'm on a Mac. Any, any thoughts on that? Or I have this workflow. Your workflow generally, anyway, should be generic. Um, I've got these protocols in place. We're developing our policies, and this is the kind of thing we're saying. You know, has anyone else had that experience who's dealing with these things? So I'd say there's actually a lot that you can give back, even if it's not actually bringing them into your space necessarily. Um, but there is, there is definitely, um, I think a lot of what we're doing is either generalizable or it's uh, particular uh, tool-based, in which case it doesn't need um, a context or a content type um, that we're dealing with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 